video will focus on John Rodney Buckmaster, who was active from 1934 to 1955 as an English actor on the stage, in films, on television, and also as a cabaret singer-songwriter in the American West. He was born in 1915 and died in 1983. He was the son of British actress Gladys Cooper and Captain Herbert Buckmaster. Educated at Eton College, he followed his mother into the acting profession and worked on both sides of the Atlantic. During World War II, he served as a private in the United States Army Air Force before resuming his acting career until the mid-1950s. He was born in England in Frinton-on-Sea where his mother had bought a cottage. Most people had fled this small town at the start of World War I, but Gladys kept her daughter Joan, born in 1910, and baby John there in the care of a nanny, while she herself stayed in London to be near the theater, and she went down to see them every weekend. His father, Herbert John Buckmaster, was a veteran of the Boer War, and he was known as Buck. He founded the Bucks Club and would later put the buck into the drink Bucks Fizz. He enlisted as soon as World War I started and was given a commission in the 12th Reserve Regiment of Cavalry. He went to France with the Royal Horse Guards in early 1915, where he remained for three and a half years. During the war, Gladys wrote daily to her husband, giving him regular updates on their two children including their son's stages of development from infant to toddler to little boy. Gladys was widely photographed on picture postcards in which her children were also featured. At the end of the war, the couple found that they had drifted apart due to not spending a lot of time together, and they divorced amicably in 1921. When they divorced, John was still a child, and it had a profound effect on him. The press did not ignore John either. He was the son of a famous actress, and one of his earliest appearances on stage was in J.M. Barry's The Admirable Crichton at the age of eight. After its dress rehearsal, a fellow actress, Sybil Thorndike, declared he was the best actor I have ever seen. So there was a lot of pressure on John. The playwright, J. M. Barry, who wrote The Admirable Crichton and also wrote Peter Pan, in which his mother Gladys Cooper starred in the 1920s, said that Gladys Cooper was his favorite actress. She had a maternal air about her, and Barry loved all of the folklore and just feeling that came from motherhood. He was very close to his own mother and his contemporaries remembered that he approached women with something like hero worship. So it was no surprise when Gladys was cast as Peter Pan in the 1923-1924 shows. However, she was not critically acclaimed. Her acting was considered wooden and not entirely likable. But this did not stop her popularity. She was very beautiful, very photogenic, and so she appeared on the British stage for decades. At age 20, her son John had already been performing professionally for a year when he started playing in a 1933 play, uh, Toverich, which had been running regularly and it ran for 414 performances under John's acting. And John found living in the theater world very easy because he knew the wardrobe mistresses. Uh, they were often working for his mother as well. And so he was, he kind of had a step up here. There was definitely some nepotism going on. During the first half of 1936, John moved to New York to join his mother and Philip Merivale in Call It a Day, a family comedy in which he played the son of his mother's character. He had inherited her gift for mimicry that put him in the top flight of cabaret artists on Broadway and seemed poised to follow her success on the stage. 
At the end of 1938, he was playing the part of Lord Alfred Douglas, very aesthetically pleasing part in the production of Oscar Wilde. In the title role of this play was Robert Morley, who became Buckmaster's brother-in-law after marrying his sister Joan in 1940. And Morley had made something of a sensation. He was very good at playing Oscar Wilde. He kind of looked like Oscar Wilde. And during this period, Morley and Buckmaster shared a flat in New York and got on very well. In Morley's 2017 autobiography, he said, John and I rented a pianola for our apartment and gave all night poker parties. I even befriended the local police commissioner, Kennedy, who took me on night raids in his police car and kindly introduced me to several leading members of the mafia. Nowhere in the world is success in the theater so enjoyable as in that city, where all the head waiters know your weekly box office takings and all the cab drivers are out front on your opening night. In early September 1939, Gladys wrote to her daughter Joan in England that John and Jack Maribel are thinking of joining the forces in Canada. John has been writing awfully good songs lately and making quite a name for herself in cabaret. But a few months later, in Christmas, by Christmas, she was sending him money. So was John spending all of his money on these late night poker parties? You know, maybe. By July 1940, Gladys had not seen her son for 18 months, and she drove to Colorado from Los Angeles, uh, where her son was performing in cabaret. During his act, Gladys was introduced as John Buckmaster's mother, which he said made a nice change from him always being known as Gladys Cooper's son. So we see the tension there between their acting careers. By the spring of 1943, Buckmaster had enlisted as a private in the U.S. Army Air Forces and composed a song, which he contributed to one of the service magazines. His stepbrother, Jack Maribel, was flying for the Royal Canadian Air Force, and both of them spent time at the family home in California when they were on leave. In 1946, Gladys decided to launch the stage career of her youngest daughter and half-sister of John, Sally Pearson. And so this became her focus. And John already struggled with the fact that his mother had gotten divorced from his father and remarried. He was not a fan of Sally Pearson, his half-sister. Um, and when he was at Eton and you know, being bullied by other boys for his mother being an actress, which was not considered a respectable profession at the time. He remembered this and he remembered their divorce. And so there were cracks in the family structure um, really coming to light when John was serving in the United States forces. So during the late 1940s, after the war, and up to the mid-1950s, he remained in the United States. He did not go to England to spend time with his family. And so you can see Buckmaster in An Inspector Calls, Caesar and Cleopatra, and St. Joan. These stage performances were interspersed with TV appearances, um, including in the 1954 Sherlock Holmes TV series. But at this point, his acting career was really worsening due to mental illness. Um, in 1947, at the end of Lady Windermere's fan run, which is a play that his half-sister debuted in, John suffered the first of regular mental breakdowns, which became increasingly violent over the following decade. He did engage in shock treatment, um, which was believed to treat his acute schizophrenia. There's some argument that he did not have schizophrenia, um, but in the 1979 biography of Gladys Cooper, her grandson Sheridan Morley summarized the presumed causes of Buckmaster's condition. The strains of a war in which he'd felt himself perhaps involved too distantly and too late, of a number of increasingly unhappy love affairs, 
and of ma maintaining a career which had begun with rather too much glitter and not enough training were proving too much for John. And under those pressures and the other pressure of being Gladys's son, he was now slowly but surely to crack, temporarily at first, then for longer periods until the late 1950s, a series of increasingly effective drugs were able to bring him to his present and very controlled state. The process was, however, a long, often violent and painful one. And starting as it did so soon after her last husband's death, it was inevitably to cloud equally darkly Gladys's final years. This was not something that went unnoticed by the Cooper family. Um, in the summer of 1945, Jack Maravale, his stepbrother, noticed uneasiness in John's relationship with his mother. He said, whenever I'm with her, I feel I'm always doing the wrong thing, whatever it is. John was also featuring in gossip columns um, with young actresses such as Vivian Lee. Lee later told Jack Maribel that in August 1935, while married, her first affair had been with John Buckmaster, and they remained friends after this affair. Um, at her insistence, it was John who introduced Vivian to Laurence Olivier in the autumn of 1935 at the Savoy Grill. There's nothing surprising about this. Buckmaster knew pretty much everyone in the theater. And in a really interesting twist of fate, J.M. Barry, who was one of John's first bosses, helped choreograph the 1936 film As You Like It, which stars Laurence Olivier. So all of these people were moving in the same circles. Um, John and Lee had another brief affair in 1953. Unfortunately, this affair in 1953 came during a time when both were really struggling with mental illness and they were kind of toxic for one another. In February 1952, Buckmaster, having just finished a highly su successful and critically acclaimed Broadway run in St. Joan, had the worst and most violent of his mental breakdowns. He was accused of molesting women on the corner of Madison Avenue and 67th Street at 7 a.m. He was chased through the streets of Manhattan, arrested, charged with felonious assault and the illegal possession of two knives, which he was alleged to have brandished at the police. He was committed to the Bellevue Hospital for a psychiatric check and then transferred to the State Hospital for the Mentally Ill at Kings Park, Long Island. His release was eventually secured by his stepbrother, Jack Maribel, and Noel Coward. This is sort of strange. You know, you'd think that they would want him to get better and get treatment, but Noel Coward had a reputation for being the infant terrible of Broadway, and so maybe he just wanted to cause trouble. Maybe they had the best of intentions. I'm not sure, but unfortunately, John did not get better. In mid-March 1953, he visited Vivian Lee, who was filming Elephant Walk in Hollywood. She had rented a mansion on Hanover Drive, and she was not with her husband, Lawrence. He was... Um, getting ready for the Queen's coronation that summer. Lee was going through one of her psychotic breakdowns at the time and the studio doctor and psychiatrist had organized round-the-clock care for her in which David Niven, her friend and actor, became involved. You can watch a video about this breakdown on my channel. After Buckmaster had successfully attempted, had unsuccessfully attempted to persuade Lee that they could fly out of an upper window together, David Niven called fellow actor Stuart Granger and asked him to intervene by forcibly removing John from the house and driving him back to his hotel in Hollywood. So this is very interesting. Um, John thought he could fly. Why? Was this harking back to his mother's Peter Pan days? Did he think that J.M. Barry had sprinkled him with pixie dust and he could fly out the window? 
um, during this time, Gladys Cooper was very much on the up and up. She was playing alongside Betty Davis in Now Voyager. Um, she was thought very well of. She was called, without a doubt, the most beautiful person as well as actress and a professional. She was never late one minute. She always knew every line, according to Betty Davis. Uh, she would be playing on stage in A Passage to India. She was receiving nominations for the Tony Award for Best Actress in a Play. She would go on to star alongside Audrey Hepburn in um, uh, My Fair Lady. <laughs> and you can see the warmth between them in that movie. I mean, her star was just rising and rising, and here was her son running around New York City with knives. So by 1960, um, John decided to settle into Priory Hospital, located in southwest London, where he would spend the rest of his life. He declined visits from either of his parents, blaming them for his breakdowns. And he committed suicide there by jumping out of a window on April 1st, 1983. So this wonderful actor, wonderful cabaret singer songwriter met a very tragic end and his mother and his sisters would go on acting and living without him, but they really had a hard time of it. And so it's it's just it's just a sad sad tale. If you're interested in watching some of Buckmaster's performances, you can do so. He appeared in the 1935 Checkmate, also in TV movies The Sun, Dirty Eddie, Blockade, and Uncle Dynamite.